All right. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong Calm Podcast. My name is Aaron, and we're going to talk strong communication, strong community, and how those two things build strong company. I started this podcast to help people in those areas, communication, marketing, the the digital landscape of the internet, community building, because I feel that you you have to have a community that you're serving to be successful and those two things really benefit a business or you know just people in general and the reason I'm really excited about this podcast is because I've got somebody who has done all three very successfully has a successful business is a strong communicator and is somebody who's not only a strong communicator to the community he's building but is serving the community in a lot of unique ways and that is bradley young brad how you doing good man good man appreciate it I feel like i got a lot to live up to right there i'm like whoa <laughs> well, no, man, i appreciate it <laughs> i certainly appreciate you uh spending some time with me before the storm hits and all that but um <laughs> So let's just jump right on in. Uh, Brad, you are the CEO and founder, right, of Landmark Credit Repair? Landmark Credit Repair, Gamers for Christ. Um, yes. yes. Awesome. Mm-hmm. And how long is have you been doing it? Just kind of give us a little bit of background on on, on your experience. Real well, quick. Man, right out of high school, you know, I went to the military. I came back from the Navy. And then I tried to get a job at a bank um, in Rockwell, Texas. And I went in for the second interview, thought I had the job. And she said, you know, you had some discrepancies on your credit and we can't hire you. And I was like, what are you talking about? What's the discrepancy? And I had one bad collection account on my credit report, and it kept me from getting the job at the bank. And that's the first time I realized that, you know, credit mattered. And I was like, I, you know, I couldn't get a job. And so my mom helped me fix my credit. She lived in East Texas at the time selling, selling mobile homes. She helped me fix my credit. And um, just everywhere through my 20s I went, people had bad credit where I worked at, and I was helping them on the side. And I just, there was, no matter what job I went into, it was like I'd, I'd always run across more people with bad credit. And I had a bunch of jobs growing up from 16 up and to my 20s, you know, uh, fast foods, this place, this place. But no matter what I did, it's like I was going back down that road and uh, towards credit. And so I worked for a credit repair company in Dallas when I was around 25 and um, was, you know, made the top sales guy that they had in six years in the first, you know, 30, 30, you know, three months. Wow. And um, just because I loved it, I knew we were changing people's lives because we were improving their credit because I seen a direct impact on me and uh, just people come in there clueless about how does credit work. And they don't teach us stuff in school, you know, they should, um, but they don't. And um, so that's when I got into it. So I've been in this for a long time. And, you know, we were always innovating, coming out with more things for our company that's going to help out um, in the area of credit besides just basic disputing, which I've done years ago. But as you learn, you learn more about applying the law and the how the law works and how you can do more with, you know, different things. So we've really innovated. There's a lot to credit in the niche of it. So, you know, we've been in this a long time and, and we're always improving and getting better. Awesome. I appreciate that. Um, we're definitely going to get into the more nitty gritty details and get into the to the meat of the credit conversation and how you can help directly. But do want to touch in on communication first, and then mm-hmm. we'll definitely get there because you do some innovative stuff around mm-hmm. Tyler, the local mm-hmm. community, on on getting attention for your business, mm-hmm. and you know that's you know part of the reason why I started this podcast to help people and highlight people who are strong communicators. So, mm-hmm. um, along those lines, I remember I, I still, your, your vehicles still trip me out <laughs> when I'm on the road. I'm like, yeah. Oh man, I better slow down my speed. But it's really just yeah. a really clever marketing technique that you, you deployed on your vehicles, right? The landmark vehicles, if it's, uh, they're Tahoe, the credit interceptor, the credit interceptor. Yeah. So it's like a, a, a charger, Dodge charger and a, a Tahoe mm-hmm. that are they look really similar to police vehicles. You're right, exactly. So tell me about <laughs> how that came together and like what, how, how'd you come up with that? Man, I've been doing marketing on trucks. I mean, I had a truck back in, you know, 
late 90, 2000. It had wrapped on it. it. looked like a NASCAR truck, you know, back then. And then I just, you know, went into the more different wraps and doing the rims, colors matching the, you know, four or five, six years ago. And I've been seeing more people pop around Tyler doing it, you know, the last four or five years. But I guess I'm from Dallas. I kind of took what I see in the Dallas market and other big markets and brought it to East Texas, you know, because I'm from Dallas. I've been here since, you know, 2009. And uh, I just kind of done that. Then I was like, man, what is something, you know, different? And I always had an idea in my mind, like, like, let's do something that'll give people shock and awe, you know? And that's when I was like, we got to do like, we're the protectors, we're the credit, we protect people's credit, we're the credit interceptors. And it's just a concept I've had in my mind for a long time, honestly. And it just, you know, it comes to fruition, you know, four or five, you know, four or five years ago, whatever. And I just, you know, found the Dodge car, the cop car that was, you know, somewhere. And I said, let's get it. Let's make it look just like a cop car. And, you know, you can't do the, the exact lighting and right. you can't do lighting in public parking lots. Um, but you can do it, you know, other places. And, and I put it right there at my location. And as soon as I put it there, man, people was like driving and calling me and said, hey, man, I, almost, I thought you cop car i had to slow down like well there's a school right there you probably should slow down right so it's some uh man it's just been fun you know and i get i go through chick-fil-a and they're like oh here's sort of here's your you know free food or discount or you know here's i was like wait a minute i'm not i'm not a cop i'm not a police officer you know i can't take the food i ain't gonna say i didn't take one or two times uh but eventually i was like man this this ain't right i can't take free food this is y'all think i'm somebody else so anyways it's it was fun then i got the tahoe we wrapped it done the same thing and uh, we was going to go further with like a fleet and do stuff. But um, it's, you know, it's it's been great to get more exposure and just to do something different, you know. So, yeah, it's always about, you know, doing something different. Yeah, it starts uh, conversations. And, you know, in this digital world, you know, mm-hmm. we always talk. And, of course, you know, we're, we're podcasting, we're live streaming, we're recording for, for YouTube and things like that. And it's definitely something that I, I've seen you do, you know, the mm-hmm. content and stuff. But it's always good to see how you can put that creativity into a more tangible and, you know, real world application, that marketing um, technique, right, and and see actual return on investment because mm-hmm. you know a vehicle wrap's not always going to work, but you put a different creative spin on it mm-hmm. to where it started that word of mouth conversation, right. And even basic wraps are going to be good, you know, because once you make the initial investment, they're on the road nonstop, and so you're going to be able to building brand awareness, which is real important. Um, but you do have to have some avenues for a good ROI return on investment um, for marketing or you're not going to keep growing. You know, you can't, you know, there's a there's a, a part of brand awareness, which is important, but you got to definitely have, you know, a good ROI with some marketing going on out there. Yeah. So mm-hmm. um, along the line of, you know, Landmarks Marketing, um, another thing that's caught my eye and uh, is, is really a great contribution to the local community it are the murals mm-hmm. on both sides of the your building. Bullard location. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about that and what, what inspired you to to get involved with the, the, the mural making of, <sighs> you of know, things. It's what, just what do they say again? Um, we still believe. Mm-hmm. I'm a, man, I still believe and then um, never give up. Hmm. You know, one side is, you know, black with white letters. The other side is, you know, white with black letters. And um, first we start with, I still believe. And, you know, really my thing there is like a lot of people drive old Bullard and you have the building, it's a big landscape and they do it more in Austin and other cities. And I just wanted to, I was at my gym and I seen, you know, the, the deal on the wall and it was just like a real nice, you know, encouraging, you know, at the gym. And I was like, man, I want to do something in my office that, you know, everybody sees every day, every day. And there was a girl in there and she was actually doing the work on it, you know, that done the work. And, and I, I talked to her and I was just like, I'm, what about I still believe? you know, to give people hope. And, um, you know, to this, to this day, we still have people stopping and taking photos. I've seen a mother and a daughter taking a photo in front of the location in front of our building. And it's just, I've had people say, man, I was having a tough day and I seen that sign that gave me encouragement. And I think, you know, that's really big in this community is encouragement because a lot of times we go through failures, we go through disappointments and uh, we try something that doesn't work. And so, we all need encouragement, and um, it's been a big part of my life. I've had to learn to encourage myself. You know, I've told my employees, don't look for me encourage you. Learn, learn to encourage yourself sometimes. And so that's why, you know, I want to put that out there, and it just it stands out, and it's encouragement to the community. And so, and then I was like, we got to do something the other side now. I was like, I want to do something else. And so that's when we, you know, come up with never give up, you know. Yeah, so that's it's, excellent. It's important. And I love how, you know, it, it shows – what you value um, mm-hmm. and what the company values, mm-hmm. in terms of you did you could have put, get your credit checked, 
or you know you could have put yeah. something real corny corny and salesy on there <laughs> yeah but yeah but you chose instead to do something that was uplifting for anyone mm-hmm. regardless of if they do business with you at, at all or not true right yeah you know it's about you know um we've done well the company's done well and um it's been a blessing and i can tell it's a direct correlation we're going to get in this when i started you know the gamers for christ helping the youth out i've seen a direct correlation when i made my life more about serving others and helping other people out like youth and so forth that the company just took off you mm. know and uh, i think if people would get a hold of that and uh it just it really does you know why does god need to give you more than what you have if you know it's only gonna be about you and what you're doing but when you decide to make your life about serving other people then it takes more resources to do that and when i started doing that you know the company really took off to another level I'm not saying people's can't companies can't without that but it was definitely a key component for me that i recognized and um it's you know it's about serving other people, not just, you know, you got to think about other people. And sometimes we get, we just get, think about barely getting by. But if we learn that what you give is going to come back, you know, to the right people, I wouldn't say just get everybody's on your door knocking. Um, but I say think about people you can help that's less fortunate and, and, and it'll come back to you. It really awesome. will. Is there a particular moment that you said, man, you know, I, I, I'm giving more than I ever have. And now, you know, things are working out. Was there a particular moment that, that happened that? I wouldn't say a particular moment like that. It was just like I felt a, a need to help these youth. And I was like, I want to do something. And I just started doing it. And then it started happening. It wasn't, you know, you know, there's been times I would, you know, still be struggling sometimes. But I was like, I'm going to keep on helping. And I just, you know, I found a need. I found some area of youth that I wanted to help. And I just... And it just kind of started happening, and I was like, "Wait a minute! This is like it's like a direct correlation I see here." Awesome. Um, you know? I, I do want to get into that, but prior mm-hmm. to before we get into Gamers right. for Christ, I, I want <laughs> right. to um, ask you about um, another unique uh, marketing technique that you've employed uh, in your business that I don't see very often. Mm-hmm. Um, it's an investment, I'm assuming mm-hmm. um, that that. I think you could put a lot of attention on that people are just unfamiliar, which is mm-hmm. uh, an influencer marketing right. with uh, Rico Gathers. And right. Tell me a little bit about that, how that came together. <laughs> uh, are you just a cowboy fan and you decided to, hey, man, I just want more you know, cowboy stuff? Or, or no. what was it? <laughs> I am a cowboy. I mean, I like the cowboys, you know, and I watch sports, but I'm not like, you know, when you have a business and you have so many different facets going in your life, this and you got the youth, you got this. And you, I have a lot of time to watch TV and sports all the time. You know, people's like, I know this game, this this player, this player. I'm like, you got so much time on your hands. Like, right. I'm why watch their life when you could be creating a life. You know, so it's that's like, a word. She started thinking about you're watching these people. And they know every every part of their life, the Kardashians, what they're doing here, there, and I'm just like, you know, so much about these people, but what are you doing in your life? It's just a lot of time invested. No, I just. I don't know. I just found something a waste of time, honestly. But yeah, I like the Cowboys, um, and so I watch them sometimes. And uh, I was just in Dallas, and I was doing some growth there in that area. And I was at a radio show, and ran across a DJ, and uh, we 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 hit it off pretty good. And he's like, "Man, my buddy's Rico Gathers." I was like, "Who's Rico Gathers?" I didn't know who he was. And he's like, a "Cowboy player." I'm like, "Okay, cool." And so they pitched me a you know an offer. And I was like, you know, how can I reach more people? And um, there's a lot of Cowboys fans, and so we kind of went with that and met Rico, and and um, it was a good thing, and um, just kind of took off from there, you know. But I know what you're saying. There is those strategy moves, and that's kind of what I was like, hey, how can I work with the Cowboys and do this and with Rico? And it was a good deal for everybody. That's great. That's mm-hmm. great. So is it something that people could look forward to, you know, more kind of different collaborations? What What does that look like? Uh, of course, I'm not trying to pry into your business mm-hmm. and, and that kind of stuff, but mm-hmm. to you and in, in, in the future vision of your company partnering with, with Rico and that kind of thing, you know, what, what does that look like? Um, that's a possibility, Rico. There's some other things we're looking at, too. You know, you just got to look at the end of the day, you know, the reach and what it's doing. And it definitely was a good reach to reach a lot more cowboy fans, let them know what we do and and um but it just has to be the right partnership so we possibly might, might with rico again i'm not you know um saying no um so we're we're looking at stuff in the future but those are definitely good strategy moves if you find a good area of like whether it be baseball or football and you find a player and you you know we brought him in town for the youth and that was such a good thing too is get these kids to see you know a, a you know football player up close like rico gathers and uh, you know they were just so excited. And so you know that alone, and the reaching people and bringing you 
using that as a, a tool as part of my contract to having come in and bring the youth in from the, to the local area of East Texas. That was a great thing, you mm-hmm. know, and that's what I really enjoy too. Awesome, you know. Um, yeah, that, that's great. I, I love the way that you 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 you're thinking outside of the box. You think mm-hmm. outside of the box with influencer marketing, um, with the with the with the raps, and then you know with social media too. You've built a pretty substantial so, social media presence. Um, mm-hmm. I, I've, I'm subscribed to your YouTube channel. You got mm-hmm. Ask Brad Young, where mm-hmm. you answer a lot of credit questions and things like that. Uh, yes. What kind of impact and what kind of uh, return have you seen or experienced through through social media and that content that you put out, you know, above and beyond what a lot of other businesses uh, do? Mm-hmm. You know, you, you really invest time in, in, in curating and curating like stories of people uh, testimonials of, of customers mm-hmm. um, also just helping people understand the the landscape on those different mediums so has there been anything that's you know really stood out to you in that you know it's just creating more content you know because more people want to know who they're working with what the company is and as we put that out there good production quality I just think you're gonna hit a different demographics and YouTube is a big market it's really um it's it's underestimated it's be, it's be bigger and bigger you know more people watch YouTube than they do cable TV and everything combined and so it's like I thought only eight percent of businesses are on YouTube it's real it's not many at all and so it's a very big untapped market that people need to learn to utilize and so I just you know I love being innovative and put stuff out there on all different you know areas and so we got drones and had a whole production team helping with the production of those videos and we're going to be putting out some more of those you know I just really want to put out make sure it's good solid content I'm not creating a video and has a hundred viewers you know you want to really build an audience so right now we're working on building an audience for our platform and then from there then we will come out with more content you know is what we're looking at doing yeah yeah you know? Yeah, it's definitely um, quality stuff that you're putting out. Thank you. Thank and you. Um, yeah, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. It is. You know, and it's that's one thing is like I want to put out quality content because I think what you put out there, it reflects upon you, your work and everything. So if I'm putting out quality content, they're like, man, this guy does good work, you know, and that's what we do. If, if I'm going to put something out there, it's going to be nice and quality so it's like a reflection on the work that we do as well, mm-hmm. you know, so I'm really big about that. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, you know, the quality, it, it, what's the quote? How you do one thing is how you do everything. You're right, exactly. And then, you know, it gives that that particular window of, you know, I don't, I don't know who to trust, especially in credit repair and things mm-hmm. like that. Something as important to your life as credit, it's mm-hmm. really important that a business like yours establishes trust with the mm-hmm. end consumer. Correct. And you creating multiple videos and high quality content, you just blow up that yeah. opportunity of, of, you know, you can trust me in this way because of how forthcoming you are with that right. quality info yeah you know you can't be b- hide behind the shadows and hide in the dark you know i think it's important to be out there and, and uh you know and a long time ago i was like i was like i don't want to create a company if i if i gotta hide in the shadows you know why create something if you gotta hide so you know there are we've had had frustrated clients um uh, but we help them and i and they know my number they get in touch with me i'll come to the location i'll meet you i'm here like um, we're here to help people and, and be a blessing. So I don't want to, you know, we got big, but I'm not too big that I'm untouchable and I want to be reachable. And that's why I have a card up front with my number on it. People can call me, you know, a long time ago, I put a 90 day money back guarantee in place where if you don't get results, you get all your money back because mm. that's what I'd want. If I'd done something and paid for something to get, didn't get a return, I'd be like, I want my money back. So I put that in place, and of course I've had some people say, "Well, I've done the, I've done the enrollment, so I would have got that commission." I'm like, I, that's that's great, but we didn't get the work, so we're gonna get the money back. Now that hardly ever happens. Literally, like you know, maybe out of one, maybe last year was like two or three people out of thousands of people that I gave their money back. Two or three people. That's it out of thousands. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, what is that when comparable to when you you can say you do that? Right. You know, and I think we're only as good as our word. And if we can't stand behind our work, you know, you need to do something else, you know, and I've always been a big believer in that, that I want to be able to do something that, you know, that I can help people make a difference, you know. And so it's a big, tough area in this area of credit because a lot of people get this, you know, like, well, I want this done. And, you know, I may tell them, you know, three to six months on average. And then we start working with them and they have new stuff pop up because they had new debt that come out that 
that just started happening. And they're like, well, you told me three to six months now it's longer. I'm like, well, this new stuff come on the scene and now I got to start through steps one through three with this. So that along is can be done in 30 days, but it may take another three to four months. So you just kind of start the process over. And so sometimes people get this expectation of like, well, I was told this. And it's like, well, now listen, you have this other component pop in. So we got to consider that. And some people are understanding and some people are not. Because they got this goal of wanting this house in six months. When you tell them these actions you did now are going to affect that house you want in three to six months, it's like, well, you told me this. It's like, well, these things happen. So this has affected this out what we said. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's, um, uh, you do have some people frustrated. It's got to navigate through that and help people understand. And we live in an instant gratification society. It's like Burger King. They want it right now in their way. We've right. been taught that. Everybody wants it right now. No effort, no commitment. You mean I got to go to the gym and work out and eat right and, and lose weight? I got to put some effort in? I got to... People are lazy. I'm just going to say it. And so you're dealing with a um, that kind of society where they want it right now. They get frustrated real quick. They get upset real quick. If something doesn't go exactly their way, they don't want to understand. They just want to pop off and get mad. Mm-hmm. It is that way. I, and I hate to say say that. And I have to really work on calming those people down and work with them. And I've done that many times. We're in my office and calm them down and end up praying with them. And they leave and they're like, well, thanks. You know, I. I mean, I had, had a lady had to bring her daughter in to help her get patient. She was just so frustrated, and her daughter's like, Mom, Mom. But her mom ended up calming it down, and now we're working things out. But people can react real quick today, and it's um, people on edge. And so you're dealing with many different facets of that and helping my team to help grow them up in their communication to how to deal with people in those kind of aspects is, you know, that's one thing for me. I'm, I'm a lot into to employee development with my team and to help them. And it's a blessing when I have one of my employees come and you know, say, Brad, I've been with you for four years and you know, I've just gotten better with my kids. I'm more calmer because I see the way that you interact with clients and how you're able to bring calm to a storm. And uh, you know, that's really that's what I look forward to now is help my and people develop people development and just help them improve not at the company but in their life overall. You know? Yeah. Definitely, so, definitely. We went a little tangent right there. No, but no, it's good. It's I, good I because people need, to, people need to hear that in business. And the reality of it, because people are like, well, I heard it. It's like, well, let me hear, hear this other story. There's two sides of this little story you're hearing. And so, you know, that's a lot of times I got to put out fires or whatever. And it's just like, tell, tell the person to call me. Let me hear what all happened. Right. And so I have to do a lot of that, you know. Right. And, so. you know, it, it can be it can be difficult with something like credit because it, it's it's complex and there's a lot right. of factors that come into play. Right. And and, you know, especially with someone who doesn't, you know, if they're not educated on how credit works and everything, it's just right. It, it's going to be a natural reaction to get emotional about something that's that's happening, especially right. if it's something that's important or it's impacting your your growth. Right. So it can be frustrating, and I I, I appreciate how you said you know it's important to work with somebody, kind of meet them where they're at, and have that mm-hmm. empathy and say, okay, let's kind of calm down. Yeah, and you know they're and they've been done wrong by the people. I mean, how many times have you been betrayed? Mm-hmm. How many times you had a friend you helped out and he he they done you wrong, mm-hmm. you know? So I'm dealing with people that they've been done wrong by somebody. They and so they, I mean, how many people get betrayed? How many times you had somebody talk about you behind your back? And mm-hmm. how many times you had somebody borrow money and not pay you back? Mm-hmm. You know, I got people borrow money from me and still me, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. And uh, people, I thought that so, you know, it's just we get let down this side in this community in this world. We deal with that kind of stuff, and so I'm dealing with all that. They're past issues, and they're coming to me thinking, "Is this guy being on?" You know, so I'm having to work. Like, listen, I'm talking to you. We're sitting down, but like, I write you a check right now, give you money back. And they're like, "Well, no, no, I want my credit worked on." I, you know, I'm like, "Okay, well, let's talk about this." Mm-hmm. So you know, you're dealing with people that's been hurt before and been let down, and so they automatically yeah. come into it like, "Oh, this guy, what did he just say? Is he trying to take advantage of me?" Right. You're right. done with that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's a monster in itself. It's sure. people's unforgiveness that they're dealing with and all their past issues, and you're dealing with them, and they're already like a hot potato because of what the the car guy did to them or what a, you know, a sales guy or what somebody working their vehicle or how their I mean, doctor did them wrong. Family members, who knows? Yeah. 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 You yeah. know? And uh, I, I I was just recently at the ETX Leadership Conference uh, or Leadership Summit here. It was really interesting. I went to a session and they were talking more about like teams, how teams work together and mm-hmm. they come together and they, they said, you know, teams form, they go through a storm and then they perform. And I think mm-hmm. it's interesting because like on a, on a client to... Uh, a, 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 a business to client relationship, Correct. that happens as well. Is mm-hmm. that like we, we come together, but mm-hmm. then we 
might come to a, a, a struggling point. Like yeah, expectations. A, expectations. And expectations and that kind of thing. Are, mm-hmm. are here and they didn't meet here. Um, and then there's that initial batch of conflict, but then mm-hmm. if you can move past that, earn right. that trust again, right. you're in that perform category. You can move through it, and then all of a sudden the bond is even stronger mm-hmm. than it was before. So I, Yeah, I that's that how people grow in. too, and if people won't deal with hard situations and stuff, they just avoid conflict and avoid situations because, you know, those people really never grow in life. They're always, you know, it's if you don't learn how to do deal with conflict and understanding, you'll never grow as a person in life. Mm-hmm. You have to. You mm-hmm. have to learn how to do that. That's a part of growing. And the people that learn that and and, and go for it and, and really learn how to deal with people in conflict and be patient and just learn to listen and step back and listen and evaluate and don't get offended, those those people progress in life to managers to other areas that, where they can manage more people. You always notice at a place the manager is always the calmest one. Mm. And if they're not, all the employees follow that manager. So if the manager's calm and collective, it trickles down. Just like if you look and you see a parent and mom, you look at a kid and they're real calm, look at the parents. Don't mm-hmm. the parents are real calm. You meet a store a store watching a, a place and the, the kids are calm, look at the parents are calm. You see kids are all crazy, look at the parents are kind of, <laughs> right. I hate to say it, man, but I see it all the time. Right. You know, and so uh, yeah. how you can grow in leadership and management in a company and own a company, you got to be able to manage people. I have people like leave me, I'm going to start my own credit pair. I hear, hear they do. I'm like, they can't manage their own self, their own emotions, and one or two employees, their button heads already, so they can't manage a team of four or five, 15, 20 employees. Mm-hmm. That, that takes years to develop in itself. Very true. Very true. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's move on to, uh, to to Gamers for Christ. Uh, we got, you know, a little limited time here, so I want to be um, courteous of that. Uh, so Gamers for Christ, tell me about, you know, what motivated you to start it. How, how long have you been doing Gamers for Christ? Since 2010 is when I started it. Oh, wow. So that's that's a good amount of time, mm-hmm. actually. Yep. So, um, you know, esports is becoming more uh, mainstream and that kind of thing. So yeah. just uh, share share what Gamers for Christ is, why you started it, and, and kind of what, mm-hmm. what you're doing right now. You know... I, man, literally, I was in 2009-10, and a buddy showed me Halo 3, and we started playing it. My cousins played it, and I was like a you know, like a big brother to them. And, uh, you know, they were playing Halo, and they used to beat me all the time. And uh, so then I started playing, and I really liked the game. Well, I started playing online, and I met a kid named Wade. He was like 16th at the time. I knew his brother Brandon. And this kid was just dominating. He was just throwing everybody. we come into Halo 3, and he just he just killing everybody. And I was like, man, he's good. Well, he was kind of real cocky and reminded me when I was younger, you know. And um, and uh, he done that kind of keep people away from him, you know. And uh, he was talking about these, you know, MLG events. And I was like, man, I was like, MLG. And I started looking at him. I was like, man, I, was like, I tell you what, you get a team together, I'll help you get there. He's like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. He was like, what? And um, so he told his dad, and his dad was a pastor. And um, his he told his mo- um, his mom she you know, him and his mom kind of had a strained relationship I found out, and his dad you know they, they had a pretty decent relationship, um, but anyways, he asked me I said get a team together so they got a team together and I helped him get to Chicago, and I met his family there and um, you know got him a team pass pay for the room and they drove up they didn't want you know plane tickets and all that. Which I found out later on teams won't play tickets and all that, which I'm like, this is not my arena, you know. But at the time, I just done to help them. Yeah. I didn't have an idea in mind to do Gamers for Christ. I wasn't even a thought. And I helped them get there, and a lot of kids needed help financially there. They were looking for help, and, you know, I didn't think much about it. They asked me to help them the next year in 2011 and help them go to Columbus, Ohio. And when I got there, another pro team had seen me before. They come up, and it was like, man, will you sponsor us? I was like, what do y'all need help with? They're like, we need plane tickets, hotel. I'm like... I'm like, you know, my demographics, I do landmark credit, which credit starts at 1920. Most of our clients are 25 and up. And I was like, this is not my demographic. I'm not going to make no money. But I just, I was like, you know, I said, let me pray about it. So I started talking to this one kid about the Bible and he didn't know anything about it. And I was like, a lot of people knew him in the community. They would have lands at his house during the week before the big event where there'd be 10, 15,000 people. Uh, they'd stream it and have, you know, 15, 16,000 on live stream watching, you know, they'd fly pro teams into their house, his dad's house. They'd land, you know, down below in the basement and they'd be the top pro teams that were known for Halo just mm-hmm. there. And um, so anyways, I met that kid, his name was Tots. And um, 
you know, I was like, y'all do a Bible study. He's like, will you help me? And I was like, when's the next event? He said, Anaheim, California. Back in that time for MLG, Halo had events like every month, every two months. You know, it was boom, 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 2009, yeah. 10, 11. That was peak Halo. That was peak. Oh, it was big time. Yeah. You know? And so I met just some of the top pro pe- players, and I was like, well, let me see. And, and the next day when I was leaving in 2011, when I was down at the North Market, I met Tom Taylor, T Squared. And oh yeah, I remember him. Oh, he was—he's the dude. Yeah, he started straight ripping uh-huh. one of the number one dynasty teams. Well, I met Tom and Bravo, who now works at Three Four Three as one of the top producers. You know, with over three hundred employees that make Halo. Mm-hmm. But that time, Bravo was a coach, and he would just you know try to get in the events, and he wasn't much. He was a he was a player, then become a coach, but he wasn't making much money. You know like he is now it's just cool to see these guys progress how they have but i met him at the north market i was like they live with my um, tots who i was talking to the day before and i was like man we're doing a bible study getting gamers together like really and i was like yeah i was like here i'm talking to tom taylor he's like the michael jordan of this whole gaming community right and and they're like man we'll help them. they gave me their number and i walked away and i just felt god say hey i, I inconvenience you for a moment so you meet these guys because I was getting frustrated because they were trying to do wheatgrass, and there's a new guy doing it, and I had to get cash from the ATM. I had to rent a car parked outside. I had to get the airport. I was, like, running behind. And so I was there another 15 minutes, but then they walked up, and I met them. But if I left, I wouldn't have met them. Mm. And, um, man, Tom became like a little brother, and I helped him through some things. He had got kicked out of Tots' house. I was encouraging him, praying with him, sending him the scriptures. And uh, the next event, Nobody st- showed up the Bible study. I was kind of blown away. Like, nobody showed up. Y'all had five for fires. Y'all didn't pass them out. You know, like, oh, we trying to get rid of our game. I was like, y'all said you'd help out, and you didn't help out. So I got frustrated a little bit. Mm-hmm. Nobody showed up the Bible study. Brought my cousin from out of town, and I felt like a failure. Went through all that of kept it on, you know. But the next day, my, I was like, you know, God, I, I don't have to do this. The next event was going to be in Anaheim, was going to be Raleigh, North Carolina. And I had been asked to be in a play in Tyler. This would be my first time I'd be in a stage play. And um, and so I was like, I turned that, I was like, I was like, well, if God, if you may do this, I'd do it. And then Tom came the next morning and said, man, I thought Brad was going to pass the flyers out. He didn't. I'm sorry. And he goes, man, you know, you know. You know, just, you know, I'll see you at the event. And so I seen him, he's like, he's come and gave me a hug. And he said, man, thank you for being there. You know, if it wasn't for y'all, no, I've done this last month because I got kicked out of his house. It's been a hard time. He was sleeping in his vehicle sometimes. And he was like, man, he's like, I don't know what I'd done if you weren't there, man. He was, he was just so thankful. And I was like, okay, I'm where I'm supposed to be. You know, even though they didn't make the Bible study, I could see his guy, you know, I could see him being appreciated. I'm like, all right, th- then something's going on here. Then the guys that didn't make it, they had stayed up late till three in the morning playing games and all that. And uh, who knows what else. And um, so they were just like, you know, come up to me later. I'm like, man, I'm sorry to make it. I'm sorry to make it. Well, these all become like my little brothers, you know. And um, I just met a, you know, a lot of guys. And Brett and Nate become like a little brother. I know him too. And it just really ex- exploded. And we started online Bible studies and. It was really never a thing. When I was left that event from Anaheim, and I was calling Wade, and I was like, dude, I just met Tom Taylor and Bravo. He's like, Bravo's this blah, blah, blah guy. He's a big giver in the community. He does all the charity. I was like, really? I said, I didn't even know that. And it just took off. Mm-hmm. You know, it was nothing. And I was like, what are we going to call this? And we just come up with the name, Gamers for Christ. And it took off. And the next year, there's a whole story. There's a lot to that. But at the end of 2011 or 12, I was like, I'm not going to see these kids again. And I prayed. I had a dream. Walls moved in and out. And I thought about doing a Bible study on Xbox Live. And so I texted a few kids. I had like 80 numbers on my phone from the, all the times going to different events. More kids want me to sponsor them and them coming to our Bible studies. And so I texted, we're doing a Bible study on Xbox Live. And about three kids showed up um, on there. You know, one, and then he had two friends with him, three, three friends with him, two boys and a girl. And then they end up staying. And then about 10, 15 people fluctuated in the, in the room from 7 to 1130 at night. Mm. I had to finally shut it down. And I was like, I got to go to bed. It's 1130. Right. And so I shut it down. That was a birth. And then the next event, I met Ninja, who now is big on Fortnite. The biggest. The <laughs> biggest. And him and um, uh, Jessica, his girlfriend, they were dating back then playing Halo. He come to my, one of my Bible studies. I had an event in, in Nashville. Um, um, and I actually was at a podium. They put it up there, and it looked just like a preacher podium. It was wild. It was what they put. They set there for me to, to work on. I was like, this used to be like a makeshift. It was amazing. Mm-hmm. Got photos of it still. Mm-hmm. And then we live stream at one of the events. Before the event, I'd sponsor the FFA to put 500 bucks in the FFA. And I got to do a live broadcast from the event on a Bible study. I had like four to 5,000. 
Wow. What was the FFA? You know? Free for all. Oh, okay. okay. So I sponsor. I put like five hundred bucks up for the winner. Get five hundred bucks. So they split it amongst the top three. But I put money up. You know, and then from there, I get to get on their broadcast and do the Bible study. Mm-hmm. So I would, you know, use that to reach more youth, you know. And because so many kids deal with stuff like suicide and, you know, we had last event I had, I talked about suicide. We kind of done a member of TJ. He was a, a big fitness guy that owned Massive Action or Action Massive Action Training over near Brookshire's Warehouse. Yeah. Well, TJ committed suicide, and I was going to see him, going to see him a lot, and I knew he was having some challenges, but I didn't know he was to that degree, and that was hard to hear him commit suicide. And um, he had been taught. I I found some more things out, but it had been something that had been haunting him from a, since he was a kid mm. that he'd been having those thoughts, you know. But if somebody should have told him, "Hey, man, the the devil talks to you too." It says you might as well kill yourself. You're a lot. You don't matter. Nobody cares about you. You know you might as well give up. You know nobody cares. You know you're all by yourself. You're the only one dealing with this, mm-hmm. and we all deal with stuff. You know, and so at the last event I talked about that, and somebody come up and told me that one of the kids they brought that was like you know real young had you know had thoughts like that, and I was like wow. So I knew then I was making an impact here, even local, and I felt like th- that's what I'm supposed to do, more local stuff, and that's why I've been doing it, is to reach these local kids that play games, because nobody's really talking to them. You know, it's like, hey, how's the football? You you know, and it's all this rah, 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 you know, and it's never really gut-wrenching level stuff that people talk about what they're dealing with in their life daily. Mm-hmm. And that's when you talk to these kids about, you know. So it gives you so, a... Uh, it 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 invites them in, into into something that they can do. It's like a, mm-hmm. really a developing skill set. You're right. It is and, communication, and meeting them teamwork. really, meeting them where they're at. You're right, exactly. And then you get to you know help them work through all those type of you know. If they want to talk about stuff, you know, mm-hmm. some people, so many people do, but you know, too many people want to judge them. You know, tell people I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling this way. I'm not feeling this way. People say, oh, shake it off, man. Be be strong. Be strong. It's like. Okay, that's cool, but when I'm feeling this way, you understand that you're not the only one feeling that way. The other people feel that way. They feel down or they don't feel like they can do it. They fail, you know, or we get let down. We live in broken homes, bo- broken communities. Mm-hmm. Starts rotting the family, right? How many divorces happen? Kids are dealing with that. Parents are arguing. The kids in the room. Kids go play video games and isolate. They get on their cell phone, social media. They're breaking away from can't even communicate with people. So there's just a lot of work that we need to do in the community. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 it's a actually a you know a perfect avenue for that because you know you get people around and you can actually grow true community. Right. Um. It's through it's gaming it, through through gaming. Whatever their specialty is, where it's football in the field. There's a lot of coaches in this area. Mm-hmm. Work with youth and football. They like that. Some like soccer. Some like basketball. Some may be in a choir. Some may be in a band. Some play video games. Yeah. But I think it's you such know? a great point that you said. Said, you know, kids isolate and like uh, through we all video isolate. Games, we all isolate, but we go through problems sometimes. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a very mm. easy way to feel like you're connecting with somebody else if you're constantly isolating yourself into an online community, mm-hmm. and it can be real deceptive in saying like, you know, you're you kind of hit this loop of well i'm connected with people online mm-hmm. i got friends online from different states and i've i've definitely built quality relationships right. with people online mm-hmm. but you don't always get the same level of connection as you would in in person right and right. and the the internet can be a really crazy place, especially mm-hmm. the gaming community. It's mm-hmm. a vicious community it sometimes. Can be. You know, Halo is definitely. I don't know if you all the trash talking. You go to events or trash talking, and oh yeah, I just tell my team like, hey, huh, we're not going to talk like that, you know. And and but after they go shake hands, I'm like, y'all just. And some wouldn't shake at all, but you know, but some of those kids were how they grew up, and you got to teach them a better way. And so when I'd have a team, I was like, no, no cussing, you know, you're gonna be respectful. You know, if you're going to carry the brand, you're going to be respectful. And so we were teaching, you know, those kind of values to the kids I'd bring in from different states that'd be on the team. And then it would it'd penetrate the community. And uh, we reach, reach a lot of youth like that. And it's cool to see a lot of the guys I know now that I made an impact on to see how they're developing what they're doing in life now. You know, from working at 343 to doing working at NASCAR to doing the audio and the sound, the visuals. I mean, it's it's been pretty cool to see what guys went on to do. Yeah, it really is amazing, you know, because those guys that play games, they go on the engineer and all that. They'll be, you know, like one, there's some of them in the NASCAR races with the video and all that of those those big races, and it's the summer at you know three four three making the game with over three employees and a top of the head production of a whole company. 
And so these are the thought leaders and stuff of the future, you know, that are running things. And it's it's really cool to be a part of those guys. And, you know, a lot of them look at him like a big brother. You That's know, cool. So That's cool. Yeah, it's, it really is. It's a it's a it's an important thing, and I, I really love the fact that you're doing that in a unique way. I mean, you know, there's there's plenty of youth groups out there or churches that are trying to serve kids, but mm-hmm. they don't always they they want to kind of say, well, kids like pizza, and we'll just mm-hmm. you know put pizza out. But but you yeah. know you got to meet them kind of where they're at and mm-hmm. let and and so much of um, development is about meeting people where they are, mm-hmm. not imposing anything on them, and mm-hmm. then just you know trying to breathe life where you can breathe hope when you can and and give yeah. those you know give support when necessary but not always uh kind of hammer fist it yeah you know it's about having you know just being you don't go in with an agenda to go into like you know impose your will or to impose what your thought process go in to listen and learn because nobody likes to be around somebody that knows it all that talks all the time just blah 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 mm-hmm. i want to listen to you know so i want you know somebody carry like man they listen to me they heard me and that's where I do these kid, these youth, you know, we got to like make them know we care and we're listening, not just like you're the show. Nobody cares if you're the show. You know, it's not about that. It's about coming to their playing live and listening to them and, and being vulnerable and listening to hearing them out and find out where they're at and talking to them, encouraging them, you know. And so, you know, that's what it's about. Like you said, not being the hammer. And uh, that's important. Yeah, you know, because yeah. I, I glean the most as a young man is when I there was a guy named Lanny Duck, and he's still in my life today. When I was younger, it was watching him as a young man, and he brought men in from Cambodia. They were staying in his house. He was a Green Beret, and he was taking care of men, men with their legs blown off, and uh, I always seen him doing stuff like that for the for different people. And he'd fly over to the country. I see him on CBN, which is Christian Broadcast Network, like the Seven Hundred Club. I see him on TV over there helping out and doing free medical work. He could be here, and he owned a medical supply company. It got to be worth twenty million dollars. Him and his sons ran it. But you know, businessman, and you know, treated people good. Was doing things in the community and around the world. And uh, that's what I do today, actually. <laughs> yeah. You know, I just met with a pastor from Haiti. He just came in town. And he called me when he was coming in town, and when he got here, I went see him in his son's house, Mark. But he's from Haiti, and I went to Haiti last year, and I sponsor, you know, myself, twelve, thirteen kids. And uh, I've been to Haiti about two years ago, and I've been up there. And he manages over 976 kids and over 68 or 86 teachers. He's been there for 30 years in Haiti. Mm. And when I went up there, they treated him like the pope, like the president. He goes out there asking him they hold his stuff in front of his camp, his his location there. There'll be sometimes 15 kids, up to 50 kids will be outside when we go there for vacation Bible school. And just amazing to see what that man does in that community. But it all started with me helping one kid from Haiti uh, years ago, and then I met his son, Mark, and he's like, my dad helps kids in Haiti, and he was in town in Tyler that same week. And I met him. He's become like a like a father to me. You know, we, we need to glean from the older generation, the wiser men in this community and beyond, and then we need to pass it down to our youth, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. You know, there's people that are above us that we're listening and gaining wisdom from and watching how they, they act, their mannerisms, how they treat people. And then the next step down is our equals, our peers, our people we work with that we're collaborating, working together. And sometimes people get in competition in that. And then there's the young people below us that we're passing down the knowledge to and helping them. Mm-hmm. You know, it works in that. Gen- we can even think generationally, you know, and that's that's what it's about is passing the good stuff down to the generation and grabbing it from the, the people that's went before us, our fathers and these older, you know, wives from people around us. Yeah. Yeah. I love and, um, that. I love that. I think about that quite a bit in, in terms of communication and community building. I, I think about it in terms of, you know, you have to have a leader, um, or really you have to have a belief, kind of a, 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 mm-hmm. a belief, a, a value set, a thing of, you know, these are things that you can notice in other people and then pass mm-hmm. down that wisdom or that information. Like I, mm-hmm. I, I think about how, you know, these kids who are playing games, these youth that are playing games <laughs> and what have you, somebody's not may or may not be showcasing that as a skill set or a strength of theirs. Mm-hmm. Like you mentioned team building and, and things like that to where mm-hmm. you've got to be able to share how those beliefs or values apply in different ways when people are, you know, doing things that you're not 
familiar with. So, mm-hmm. so if it's if it's football or if it's baseball or soccer or video games, mm-hmm. leadership and team building and those high qualities can be recognized in someone. It's just a matter of who is going to be working to recognize that and then breathe life and and speak it into somebody when mm-hmm. they see it you know what i mean so i think about it how like i think normally the teacher those... is whenever the student's ready the teacher shows up mm-hmm. you know you're like saying they got to find it and i think when the student's ready he seeks the teacher I, th- I mean yeah does it yeah. make sense yeah definitely you know so yeah definitely you know you're like you got to find that but i think if you create the atmosphere that the, they'll show up the ones that are you know right that are supposed to you know, that are gleaming for energy. When I was a kid and I was an, always, always been entrepreneur minded when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15, I go look for books. I would go to find the meetings where they're doing network marketing, whatever. I was just gleaming for like who's successful, who's successful in the area, my neighborhood, who's got the big house, this or that. So I can learn because you can't help anybody being broke. <laughs> right. You know, so I want to make a difference. And I grew up not having a lot. So I wanted to like, how can I grow up and have more than two pair of pants from school? Yeah. And they're not, they're not, you know, the the top brand. They're the low brand. You know, oh my God, I don't have those nice shirts all my friends have. I I didn't have a little cool dirt bike like my buddy had down the road growing up. Mm-hmm. I, I seen him and I was, you know, jealous because I wanted that. You know, so as you, as we have this want, we got to make sure we channel that to like, how can I grow and go do those things? Then it's like, okay, it's cool to have things, but like now I want to make, I want to make a difference and I want to make it impact other people for the good. And then, you know, it's just, we go through those steps and we start waking up and going, okay, what makes it matters in life? You can have all this cool stuff and have a nice this or that, but you have fun. And what's next? It's about impacting and, and helping other people. Exactly. And I think about you know? it in that, in that way of, you know, the leader is seeking to help, you know, kind of pull somebody up from, you know, their level Correct. up, right? Exactly. And then, and then ideally you've got people who are like you when you were younger looking up, trying to find uh, that ladder, right. for example. So then there's this like connection within, you know, the, you know, one's looking up and one's looking down mm-hmm. and then they can kind of meet in the middle and say, you know, how can we work together Correct. and develop this kind of community of mm-hmm. people who, and then inevitably it's going to expand with people who are, you know, like-minded mm-hmm. and trying to, to do the same thing, which is right. make an impact either, well, you know, the, the student saying, I want to make an impact in my own life, mm-hmm. where the leader saying, I want to make an impact in others. Mm-hmm. And then next thing you know, the student each, becomes a, the leader. Yeah, exactly. Right. For somebody else. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important that, you know, people understand that, Everybody has something unique to contribute to somebody else, regardless right. of mm-hmm. how old they are, whatever mm-hmm. their experience level. If you've, you know, went to, you know, step B out mm-hmm. of the whole alphabet, you can teach an A, you know, right. for example, you know, quick example. So it's just, uh, I think that's really great that you're, you're, you're showcasing the importance of that intentional discipleship. If it's, mm-hmm. you know, within um, the Christian sphere or, and, and, but, but regardless of a belief system, mm-hmm. you know, personal growth in life as well mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, really discipling somebody and training somebody up to, to be a leader and, and, and be able to make that impact. Mm-hmm. However, they're going to make that impact as long as it's a positive one. Naturally. Right. You know, and you can make an impact by teaching, but just oftentimes just by being, you know, well said. when I was growing up, I pay attention to Lanny, you know, I watch him and it, he didn't say a whole lot, but I just watch him just how he interact, how he treat people, his mannerisms. And I think as young men, we gleam a lot by watching, by looking, by paying attention. Mm-hmm. And that's how I did, man. I just watch him. I treat people as man. He's just kind, nice, just a, you know, gentle person. Just I'm like, man, that's, that's some, uh, he's different. He's different. He's not. You know, don't think he's cool. He don't think he's hip. He don't, you know, throwing his chest out. He don't have to try need to get attention. You know, not saying I didn't go through those challenges. You know, those things. We not saying men don't go through those things, but I just watch and go gleam, and and so those are what's important, and that's what I gleam from the older generation and the the men I see that are doing stuff that I respect and look up to. That's what they're doing, and I I pay attention to stuff like that, and I think that's what's most important is how we're treating other people and how we're, you know, those kind of things, those attributes. Love it. You know, um, you want to, you want to get into some, to some questions. Yeah, let's go. You want to go with some, uh, credit questions. Let's go. Um, so we, we went communication, we went community. 
um, let's talk about uh, the com, the, the 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 company, Landmark Credit. Um, I reached out to my uh, friends and said, you know, what do you want to know about credit? And I got like, it went crazy, oh, boy, it went crazy. <laughs> it, there was a lot of interest in this subject, and um, so I'm going to pull up the post real quick and uh, run through these kind of like a rapid fire round for you. Okay. We're going to test the credit expert. Uh, test me <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and see what kind of value we can bring to people um, because there's people from all different all different you know walks of life and in mm-hmm. credit situations so let me pull it up real quick talking I see one about credit score the calculation that was said our current credit ca- credit score calculation methods and accurate representation of a person's giving credit Mm-hmm. It's by Josh, Josh, Josh Jarvis. Josh. So you want to talk about that credit cal- score calculations? Yeah. So Man. so talk about credit uh, score calculations and if it's an accurate representation uh, representation of a mm-hmm. person's given credit. So the credit score that we get on uh, what's the app? What's the what's the credit karma is one? Credit karma or or yeah. maybe a lot of banking apps have it. Is uh-huh. that accurate? Because you know when you say accurate, there none of them's accurate. <laughs> Let me just say that because they all come up with their own credit score model. The first company who started credit scoring was FICO, Fair Isaac, you know, back in the 80s. And they started it. Well, everybody said the credit reporting agencies, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax said, well, they're taking our data and creating a credit score, which is called the FICO score a long time ago. And they're like, well, let's let's start creating a credit score. So all the three major credit reporting agencies create their own credit score. And I have all these other entities out there come up and said, hey, here's a credit score. So it's not like, you know, you get on a scale and the same scale at Walmart, one plus one equals two, a pound is a pound. Mm-hmm. There's not no accurate calculator like that for credit scoring because everybody has come up with their own formulas. Mm. Yeah. So there's the Experian, the TransUnion, and, and Equifax. Equifax. But there's also Fair Isaac, which was the first one. Mm-hmm. And so I tell people it, it depends upon who your bank uses, your financial institute. If you're going to get a, a mortgage, there's more or less mortgage scores. If you're going to get a car, they normally have like a car score. And so I'd say it depends on what your goal is. I would look at the, those directions to find out accuracy. Got it. So if I'm going to get a mortgage, I'm going to get a home, I'm going to go to a mortgage broker that can get me a mortgage score because that score may be different than Credit Karma. Credit Karma can be, you know, 20, 40 points, you know, off of those. But also the reporting of accuracy of the data could be off because I've had Credit Karma show 20 bad accounts to somebody's credit. I start working on it and I get off, you know, say 12 bad accounts. Well, still, it may still, they still may still be on there, but they're not on the actual report from Experian, TransUnion, Equifax because I got them off the original source because that company, Credit Karma, hasn't got the data report to it. So people's like, well, my report shows I got 20. I'm like, well, we got your actual reports from Experian, and these 12 got deleted. So you don't have 20 more. You only got eight. Mm -hmm. But they're looking at the app. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the apps can be, you know. It takes a long time. Yeah, sometimes they don't always get the proper data. So, you know, there's a lot to credit scoring and all that. But I tell people, if you're going to get a home, go to a mortgage company, get your mortgage score, find out what that is, and get me those reports. Let's look for work from those reports and those scores. But you can, I've actually pulled one from, like, say, Credit Karma and then Privacy Guard in the same within minutes, and it was 60 points difference. Wow. So people go online, they get their, they come and go, man, my score is a 620. They start working with this and they go, man, I pulled my score and it went, it, 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 it went down to 580. I'm like, where'd you go? They go, well, I went to this. I'm like, where'd you go the first place? What was this? They went to two different sources. So, you know, you got to go. It's you gotta, so, so really, you're saying it, what I'm hearing is it's really important to know what your goal is. Mm-hmm. Before because, you worry about your score. You can go look at Credit Karma and say, okay, this is my ballpark score. But what is my mortgage score? What does a mortgage company say? It could be different than this score. Yeah. Same with like car insurance. Car insurance is going to be a different score, score different too. too. Mm-hmm. So, so are those scored? Um, are those scored? The, all those scores are based on those four reporting agencies, though, Three. right? Three, three reporting mm-hmm. agencies. Experian, TransUnion, Equifax. Okay. There's literally thousands of reporting agencies, but everybody uses those three. Got it. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's go to the next one. Oh, how does paying off a Harley help more than a car? I guess he's saying he paid off his car and his Harley made a better impact. Uh, you know, I would say, see, there's three types of reporting on a report. There's in for mortgage. I for installment and then R for revolving, which is a credit card. So if he had a Harley or a car, it's an installment. And so 
it may have just been that he paid his car down first and his debt to income ratio went a, went a little better because he paid more of the say the limit was a thousand he was using 900 he's maxed out on his utilization of that limit of a thousand if he paid it down to 400 he's at 40 percent utilization so that looked good but if he had another loan and he paid down his harley next and he got it down below it's like oh my god when i paid that down i really went up the my score went up the most because his total utilization went down so maybe thinking the Harley made more of an impact where, when overall that his installment debt got down and his utilization looked better overall for for his installment. Got it. So it was so more, probably more. it wasn't just say as Harley. It was probably because he paid one off and the other one when they both hit below the thirty percent threshold of total installation debt utilization that his score went up. So it's about utilization of whatever installation debt you have and revolving debt you have, getting that paid down close to zero as possible. Revolving below thirty percent, below fifty percent is good. Anything above fifty can drop your score. You know, thirty, fifty points, sixty points, depending on your credit score, how high it is. So, okay. but the lower your score, the the more you get to pay down to zero in your evolving debt credit cards, the higher your score is going to go. All right, I'm saying a lot of percentages and stuff. Know, so you, 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 you're you're you a, want uh, to go here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you you mentioned installment, revolving, and, and mortgage and mortgage. Mm-hmm. Okay, so and then you talked about the credit utilization of each of those. Correct. So the utilization mm-hmm. when you're talking about percentage. So I, somebody's allowing me a thousand or four thousand dollars of let's just use a thousand of uh, of a credit limit. Uh, a limit a thousand dollar limit. limit. Mm-hmm. So so um, I know that there's some questions in here that has to do with, you know, the utilization of that. So Mm -hmm. is it important to have some credit of in those sections utilized at all times? Like, do you want to kind of pay off a a card completely and then shut it down? No, because when you close the old card, it kills your credit score because 15% of a credit score is credit history. Got it. So, so older people have higher credit scores normally because they've been around longer. Their credit established has been established longer than yours. So you're saying that if if I've got a credit card that I got you know eight years ago, mm-hmm. the last thing I should do is shut, shut it, it down. Because when you shut it down, you lose all your history with it. So you don't want to shut it down. You want to keep your older cards. You know, um, you want to sh- you know at least keep two or three cards going. Now. Uh, the fastest way to build your credit and your credit score, I had a $3,500 credit card. I got to $7,000 limit, which helped, which helped me in the long run because I have higher utilization overall. So if you're getting ready to buy something, say, real quick, then you need to pay your cards down close to zero, and it's going to give the highest credit score possible. But if you're looking to buy something in six to eight months, then I would take those cards and I would max them out. And just like groceries, gas, whatever. You're, you know, don't go buy stupid stuff, but your normal bills, put on that card. Okay, like I had a three thousand dollar credit card, thirty five hundred. They raised it to seventy seven or seven thirty five to seventy five hundred. It's like a thirty five hundred increase in like three like three to four months. So I would max it out, and then I'd pay it off when the bill come due. Max it out, and pay it off. What that done was the credit card company said, "Well, he's responsible. He's maxed this thing out. He he's shown responsibility the last three to four months, and they raised my credit limit to seventy five hundred, seven thousand seventy five hundred. Interesting. And so then I had higher utilization and more available credit, which looks better to a lender when you go to them. Because mm. I have it available, but I'm not using it. So it shows responsibility. Got it. Okay. Let's go to uh, Jacqueline says, does my medical bills that I can't currently pay affect my credit? I've been told no previously by a possible not trusty with you person. But, but if you can see it, I don't understand why they wouldn't hold it against you. So there you go. The question it's on there. It's on there. It's negative. It's pulling your score down. You know, if you're getting ready to buy a home, I do have a mortgage buddy. I know people from him, you know, if we dispute those within the 30 day window before they get ready to apply, they won't appear on the calculator. So there are methods to get around that when you're trying to buy a home. But a car, you know, they're right. It's not going to keep you from getting it, but it'll affect your credit score. It'll affect your credit score, which is going to affect your interest rate. Mm-hmm. And the interest rate, especially if you're talking about a home or a car. One percent on a home could be a hundred thousand dollars. You can pay an extra, you know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on a loan. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, so one percent's a lot. Even a half percent is. Here's here's a quick one that you'll probably be able to answer fast. Mine sucks, but mm-hmm. working on it. Need to know how to clean it up. Well, you know, you get clean up, you need to work on repairing your credit. And either like learn how to do it yourself and take the time and try to figure it out and hope you get it hope it works out, or you get with a professional. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> how, period period, that's all it is. How would you know? somebody like even even begin trying to get down in the in the in the in the brushes like like you do? 
I'd work for another company to figure it out. You know, you can learn basic stuff online, but that's not the nitty gritty. You have to w- work somewhere to figure it out. It's like, you know, um, Aaron, go build your own house. I'm going to build my own house. Go get a book and try to build your own house. Right. You know, the edges ain't going to come out matching. You got a professional builder that's been there for 30 years. You're going to live in that home or the home you build? Mm-hmm. Go represent yourself as an attorney who has all these years' experience. He's dealt with all these cases. He's dealt with judges because I'm dealing with entities like the credit agencies. I'm dealing with the collection companies. I now have law firms I work with that know the law. We know how to. There's so many facets of it. You know, it's just like people's like, well, I, you know, to do your own, go try to figure it out. Man, it's, it took a long time. And I worked at the Cumbies and I trial and error. And then I had to pay somebody that's that's been in this field that I dropped 10 grand on to improve my letters and get them even better. That would be, you know, lawsuit compliant. Because now, you know, recently, if you do a lawsuit through a law firm, I work with law firms and we'll do lawsuits against, a, you know, the credit bureau, a collection company. Um, they'll ask to see your dispute letters in court. And if they're not um, done right and they said, like, not mine. Which is it? It is yours. You can be held liable for that. They can come after the credit repair company, mm. which they're doing. Mm. I work with law firms around the, the country that specialize in this field. There's nobody local in Tyler. Years ago, I was like, I want to help my clients to another level, and I could find no attorneys locally that would help me that knew it. You know, and so I had to go find people that specialize in this field around the country. And I have other law firms. I work with a top one out of California that actually approached me not too long ago, and we're doing stuff where they're reporting. Um, a balance, a zero balance, but they're reporting late payments, which you can't do both because it drops your credit score. And so we have like a good 80% of our clients had those issues, which each one is like a $2,500 lawsuit against, you know, one bureau, another 1500 or 2500 against the other two. And then it gets a furniture of the company who reported the data. And so we're, I have a whole department set aside just for violations and we're constantly getting new information to say, these are issues that are violations on reports that, that are not fixed and allows us to use those, those tools in the law to get them off and put financial stuff back in our client's pocket. I wish they come off the normal way, but if they don't, I'm find out how can I be innovating and get them off and that's about like we talked about becoming better improving and that's what we do and so we probably probably 90% of our client base has active violations and where we have attorneys get involved and they send out you know demand letters and they and which is 15 days to respond and so we get it removed and the client gets money in their pocket wow so it's just like interesting you know, there's so many depths to this area of, oh, of man, practice, yeah. you know, and a lot of people, they go, oh, I went to Credit Karma and they do dispute online. And then they think like these big companies like Lexington Law, they're like, oh, it's a law firm. We found out years ago, Lexington Law used the same dispute process as Credit Karma does. When you go on Credit Karma and you want to dispute something, you say, not mine. You call Lexington Law, ask them how to dispute, and they go, not mine. Hmm. They dispute the same way as consumer disputes because why they're a big dispute mill. They want to do thousands of clients. So all they do is they go on the, the Experian Trans Equifax website and you can choose whether to dispute not mine, never late, et cetera. And those are the only way they dispute like three or four ways and that's it. Which the law allows you to do so much more. So interesting. Yeah. So it's sad that they do that. It's such a disgrace for for people that had no clue that they're doing the same thing you can do on Credit Karma. It's a big law firm. Yeah. That looks like. And they're charging you hundreds of dollars for it. Yeah. And also they tell people, um, I had somebody that was getting sued by a collection company. And when they called and they said that we can't help you here, go to this uh, uh, aboutlaw.com, which is a national national website to find an attorney in your area. And they're a law firm, but they wouldn't help them with the issue from a collection company that they kind of created they're a part of. So I got learned attorneys that help with us actually get down the nitty gritty and do things properly. There's just, there's people that stuff average and get by and there's people go to the next level. Awesome. Period. You know? Right. Um, so. You kind of touched on this. Uh, curious when they offer to raise my credit, if I should choose to do so or not, since I've been told that if you don't use it, up to a certain percentage of what already is available, then it can negatively alter your score. No, nah, use a limit. If they're giving you a chance to raise your limit, raise it. Raise it? Mm-hmm. Heck yeah, because you got more availability. On those credit cards, it shows better. You know, just don't use it all. Just keep it paid down, you know, especially when you're getting ready to go buy something. I take advantage of flyer miles. I got over 200, close to 250,000 flyer miles I'm about to take me and my mom on a trip to um, uh, um, somewhere over in Mexico and, you know, pay it'll be paid for and I can go... I could do a lot of flying this year, not pay for anything, mm. you know. So I, I use it for flyer miles, like AA American Air, Airlines, and I can get double fly miles and stuff like that with specials, and 
use it if you got it use it yeah use get a card that has miles and benefits and pay it off when the bill comes due i'll pay it off and it's paid off and i just build up flyer miles and get to fly for free uh what activities other than your own of uh activity affect your score it's an interesting question but I'm not sure I understand that question. Maybe uh, talking about like uh, spouses, maybe like the if if I'm married, mm-hmm. does the credit that my wife sets up and does on her own affect my score? No, not if they no. don't apply. Put it in your name. Only if they apply, put it in your name. Got it. If they put it in your name, anything your wife does affects you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let's see if there's anything else. Oh, one thing, uh, somebody says, one thing I hear very often working with a primarily geriatric population is a misconception about inheriting debt. I would love Mm -hmm. if more people were educated about how the estate process works for someone with debt. Do you know anything about like inheriting credit card debt or anything like that? If you, if you're on the credit card, if you're on the credit card and you're signed, then you, you're responsible. You can be responsible for it. Got it. Um... What do you think about this? This is a good question from from Michael. Uh, how do we get away from relying on credit as quote worthiness? I feel this system is designed to keep the ignorant ignorant. And then he follows up with credit is a highly subjective metric that rates people who are now allowed to borrow money only ten percent of which actually exists. So, what do you think about that? It's in terms of you know just the way that America has valued credit for you know, as long as we have, um, as a subject of somebody's worthiness in a job, somebody who was denied a job, you mm-hmm. know, your personal experience mm-hmm. denied a job based on credit. Mm-hmm. Do you think, I mean, what, what do you think about that? Uh, is that something well, you know, that my, should be changed? Or? My thing, you know, I had one collection account, so, you know, I got kind of thrown, you know, cause one thing they didn't even ask about it and I, I got turned out for the job. So I think, you know, in every area we have to investigate more or why, you know, so I think they should ask me, you know, what happened here? But, you know, I think, you know, credit worthiness, it does matter to a degree. we got to have some kind of metrics to, to de- determine who you let borrow money. You know, have you let people borrow money that didn't have a good track work record and they didn't pay you back? Mm-hmm. There you go. Which I bet you wish you'd have paid attention to their credit, right? Their credibility. <laughs> so our credit is our credibility in the marketplace. So we got to have some kind of matrix how we're going to look at things and 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 make a decision. Can I let somebody loan money? So that's what credit is. You know, I say your credit your credit is your credibility in the marketplace. So if you take care of that and you take care of it well and you handle it well, you know, people will loan you money. But if you don't take care of it well and you spend crazy, you go crazy, you probably can get loan money, you know. And so, you know, even we look at credit sometimes when we look at hiring people, but I, I give people the benefit of the doubt when they're like, hey, I've been through this, I've been through this. I'm like, all right, cool, we're not going to hold your credit against you. We work on credit. You know, a lot of people will come work for us, and after so many months, we work on the credit for free, you know, as an employee. And so, you know, there, you know, it does play a part. I think it's, we got to have some kind of matrix in the society that I'm going to say, you know, you're a credible person to pay me back, you know, because I've had so many people that, that should let borrow money and they didn't pay me back. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it's, so. it, 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 it is important to have some sort of metric. And, you know, you have to. I, I've heard of, uh, you know, like China and other countries doing some crazy stuff with the way like, that they cut va- your arms off and cut your hands off. <laughs> well, not that necessarily, but oh, okay. like the, in, in modern times, I think it's 2019 or 2020, China, I think it's China, mm-hmm. um, they look at more than just your financial stuff they look at your social media and your internet behavior and all these other things that right. contribute to your score you need some crazy <laughs> people out there on facebook yeah it's <laughs> on like, the internet exactly <laughs> so uh why does it take so long to build credit it really doesn't you can build credit in like 30 you know three months you know it doesn't take a long time to build credit it can take a while to stab, build established credit but to get us, you know, I had a 600 credit score for, you know, a number of years. I just had a truck under my credit. And then I um, I used the innovative technique. You can just call piggyback, you know. And my grandmother added me to three of her cards. And within 30 days, my scores went up 100 points in 30 days. So, you know, that's a that's an innovative method you could do. It's called piggybacking. And, and uh, the years ago, they said it didn't matter or didn't help, but it does help. And they do report it. They yeah. try to, like, they don't want you to use that as a technique. And uh, so that's a way you can help establish credit is by getting your mom or dad, somebody you really know, to put you on their credit card as an authorized user. It just makes sure they don't go rack the card up and you yeah. know have, you know, keep a high balance on it because then that's not going to help you. Got it. You know? um, is there a correct ratio of revolving lines of credit to non-revolving? Is there Say like- it again now. 
like is, is there a, a correct ratio of revolving lines of credit to non-revolving is there- it really doesn't matter you, you know if you don't have established credit you're going to need to get um you know you're going to you're gonna need to put money down you're going to have to establish it so if you you know the what was the two lines of credit the non-revolving what do you say revolving and non-revolving so I guess he's talking about like uh, revol- credit that's actually active, and then you have those cards that just uh, you don't use. Yeah, again, you know, if you don't use them, eventually they're liable to shut them down. You know, so I keep about two or three cards and just go put the stuff you need on them and pay them off. You know, don't use them to get into debt because you know then you're working, making money to pay. You know, you make less hourly because you're losing it, throwing away an interest off. You know, not paying your your credit cards off. And you need to save, you know, invest, you know, you can, you know, it's the only thing about it being a consumer, but by thinking about growing something and having some kind of investment, you have to. Got it. You know. Um, so let's, let's do a, those are some great questions. I really appreciate everybody asking and thank you so much for giving oh, yeah, some man. clear, clear answers. Um, let's, let's kind of package it into like three different people because okay. I do work with a Gen Z, you know, she's just coming into, she's about to turn 18. What's like, what you call it? A Gen Z. So after millennials, there's Gen Z. <laughs> I think that's what they call them. <laughs> that's funny. So, so the younger people, mm-hmm. you know, people graduating high school, somebody with brand new you know, credit. credit. How? What's the best way right now for them to start establishing credit? They asked me one day, and I was like, mm-hmm. I don't know, but I'm two things I would do. I would try to get you a credit card, like go to creditcards.com, and you can do ones that you got to put money down to get a credit card, and get you put some money down and, and get your credit card. You may put ninety nine bucks down, get your credit card, and may just have a two hundred dollar limit. Start making payments on it, pay it off, charge it up, pay it off. Do that for a few months, and they should raise your limit, and then maybe try to get another one. But I would try to get one of those ones that through creditcards.com of no credit to start building it. You know, I would do that. Then I go to a local bank and get, try to get um, put a savings account, put money in a savings account, and try to do a loan with the bank where you um, you know you put money in a savings account, you take a loan, and you just use that money to pay it off to tell them you want to start establishing credit with a local bank. And that'll show up in your credit. And that'll start helping you build a credibility with the bank and the credit card. Those are two different sources. One will report as an installment through the bank, and the credit card report as a revolving. And those are your two important components. Mortgages down the road, don't want to worry about it. But those two components are the most important. I'd stay away from fast cash stores, places that say loan you money, we report your credit reports, because they don't look good. Those reports are financial companies, and a bank will think you're dumb because they know you pay crazy. They won't, I'm not dumb, but let me be politically correct. They'll think you're not so so wise, so smart. <laughs> this is a strong, calm podcast, man. You can, be, you can, know. You can well, t- you, hope so. You keep Everybody's, people real. You know, you know, got to hurt people's feelings. <laughs> but, you know, that's the thing is, you know, you want to learn the right place to go to and stay away from. So those fast cash places that borrow money and you make payments, they report, but it doesn't look good on your, your report. And a bank doesn't, they frown upon them because they know you're paying a high interest rate for them. So I would do those, and then I would see if they have any friends or family that have good credit, like I did with my grandmother, and she had me a three of her cars, and my scores went up 100 points like that. So those are some quick techniques I do, those three. Awesome. Start with those three. Awesome. Okay, say, uh, you know, you've established some credit, like I'm 29, so say somebody like me, maybe early 30s or something like that, they've done some, mm-hmm. you know, credit, that kind of deal, um, but... Say say it's somebody who's got uh, like a six hundred score, like a mid range score. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're gonna be stung on some on some on some interest rates. They're not gonna get the best interest rate, mm-hmm. but they have some credit. They might be able to get something, but the interest rate's real high. So what what's something that somebody can do? Like six hundred, you don't mean get a pretty good rate. You know, six hundred, six twenty, five fifty, five twenty, something like that. Well, they probably have some bad stuff they need to take care of. You yeah, know, some bad stuff they need to figure on their own or call a professional like myself. <laughs> right on. So one or two options, you yeah, know. Yeah, because you really got to look at, at you got to look at the root of the problem, really, mm-hmm. before you can really. Yeah, because start it's hard it. to build any good if you have bad on there, and just you know, a few collection accounts, one or two collections can keep your score down. You can't add enough good on something, make it to 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 remove the bad. The bad's still there. You got to take care of it. You know, you can eat so you can work out all the hard you want, but if you don't eat right, that's going to be counterproductive. So you need to do both at the same time: take care of the bad and add the good. Awesome. You know, so cool. What um, was the other one? Uh, well, the other ones I think if they had a high credit score, a decent one, how do they raise it? Yeah. And the main component with that is I'm just trying to be an 800 man. I know. The main thing with that is just to get more longevity and to pay those cars down closer to zero that you have. But if the limits are not real high and you want to raise them, then that's when I would start, you know, using a lot of the limit 
and then pay it down when the bill comes due. Use a limit, pay it down when the bill comes due, and that'll start building the limit higher and higher, and then that'll start establishing the credit better. Got it. And that'll raise the scores. Just don't be late on anything. You know, be on time. Don't close your old credit cards. Do it responsibly. Yeah, don't close your old credit cards. That'll kill your credit score. Awesome. So do you think, you know, you, you've got the uh, – there, there's a video out there, a YouTube video or something where it was like Dave Ramsey versus Brad Young. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I was working on that. We didn't we didn't pop it out there yet. But, yeah, I was – he just – I mean, he says credit doesn't matter. You know, yeah, he just, says he says debt is dumb. Which you know, are, I mean, you, and debt is dumb, but it's in the right context. Because I can use credit to build credibility, and get it, and get it. I, I got turned out for a job. Mm-hmm. You know, I, that wasn't my fault. That happened. That that I went to the military. Bally's Total Fitness said they canceled my contract. I sent a cancellation in. Right. And they the didn't gyms, cancel. Man, the gym. Back in the day, there were two year contracts. Sent a cancellation, in, and they still hit on my credit report. So you know, wh- oh, what am I supposed to do? I got to take care of it, and. That's how I learned credit repair. People go through divorces. You know, people lose jobs. You know, look at the oil in the oil industry right now. That went crashing years ago. You know, people had these things and then all of a sudden they couldn't afford it, lost income. Bad things happen in people's life and their credit's affected. And you've got to have people out there that can help you with that. Do we live in a perfect world? No. Divorce happens. Things happen. Stuff happens. There's another word. This the crap happens, right? <laughs> and so we got to have ways to take care of that. And so when Dave Ramsey, you know, he's like, credit repair doesn't matter. It's like, I'm just, I can't, I can't deal with that. It doesn't make sense because I help so many people and it does matter and it does make a difference. I mean, so many people that couldn't get a job, couldn't get it. I mean, couldn't get a car, couldn't get a house and I'm able to help them. It's just, a, you know, and they have like fifty, sixty thousand dollars in medical debt. They didn't plan on that happening, that accident that happened or cancer. Or, mm-hmm. What are you going to do? You just tell them, hey, sorry, sorry about that. Go figure it out. Go pay all your debt off. It's 200000 50, half a mil. What are you, you going to do? They, mm-hmm. So they're supposed to hold their life off and live with their parents instead of trying to get a house and putting the whole stress in the whole family. It doesn't make sense. You know, you got to think, you know, it's not cookie cutter for everything. It's There's not one thing fits everything. You know, mm-hmm. we got to be innovative. Love it. Awesome, man. Well, um, is there anything else you, you got to say? I think we covered communication, community, and company really, really well. I appreciate your time. Oh, yeah. Um, you're a leader in our in our uh, area. You're a dedicated person building relationships. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I can tell you that you really love what you're doing uh, right mm-hmm. now, and there's a lot of value in that. So I appreciate, appreciate your time, man. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. Go see this man. Uh, on Old Buller Road here in Tyler and then uh, online go follow him like his page Landmark Credit Repair ask Brad Young on, on YouTube like me follow me uh, <laughs> like share so weird. subscribe <laughs> like follow me that's the way we gotta everybody do it everybody says they like follow me it's funny you gotta that's do cool. it that's you cool. gotta do it awesome man well thank y'all for listening um, yeah we'll see you next time <laughs>